Growing up, my father was my hero. The one person I was convinced was invincible. He sat before me as a symbol of strength. His life struggles were written in every vein. Long days of hard labor had him looking like Popeye. They also prevented him from being home and spending time. He used to make it up through our monthly trips to the grocery store. We used to go shopping at Winco late nights. My father hated crowds and couldn't stand long lines. These trips were a privilege, one he reserved for his two oldest kids. During our rides, he would entertain my brother and I with prison stories, getting his nose broken in a group fight and stabbing a guy through the hand with a fork in the lunch line. I was taught that you could never trust a cop. If you ever caught snitching, you could find yourself lit on fire like the biker in the auto body shop. Each story would end the same. We were told that prison was a horrible place and that his mistakes were lessons. Now I know he told us these things with good intentions, but my mind interpreted them differently. I wanted to be like the man in front of me. I wanted to wear the cape of my hero. First it began with schoolyard fights. Then it escalated to me staying out all night. My dream to fill his shoes became his nightmare. He began to lose his son as I aged with each year. It was my turn to be the man from the stories. I got respect from the pistol I was holding, never knew I had it aimed at my own head. 2009, I was given seven and a half years in prison. The same exact time my dad did in the state pen, which had me asking if this was a cycle or coincidence and how many of the kids were sitting in the same circumstance. Handcuffs fit their wrists perfectly like a twisted family heirloom Prison is not an heirloom, yet it is passed down through the same lips that say I love you. Fathers, carefully craft your messages for your children before you send them. In an attempt to emulate their hero, they might just become the villain. In 2009, I was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison under Oregon's Measure, measure 11 Mandatory Minimum Sentencing Guideline. I was 17 years old, but I was to be sentenced as an adult. Now, leading up to that sentence, my life took a lot of different turns for the worst. But you see, one thing that I noticed when I was in those facilities was that my story was not uncommon. You see, it was more of a symptom. And I realized all of us were struggling with school. All of us who were in that system had come from some sort of family background that was a little broken and fragmented. We were hurt kids. We were kids who were victimized, who would then become the perpetrator for a lack of better words. So I was robbed during a drug deal gone bad. Um, before I, I had turned 17, you know, I had, I had joined the gang around 12 years old. I started hanging with the guys in the neighborhood. The big homies showed me how to move weight, how to sell drugs. By the age of 12 years old, I was moving drugs full time. By the age of 13, I was initiated and jumped into the gang. And my life really started going through this, this crazy cycle of violence. Now, when I was 17 years old, it was just one of the most unstable times in my life. My mom had ended up leaving. She left the abusive relationship with my father, and I did not blame her for it one bit. But when my mom left, she left with the gravity of our home. She held everything together. And when she was gone, we all started going through it in our own kind of way. I was 17 now. I began taking that anger and that frustration back to the streets. And I ended up getting robbed, as I said, for 3200 It was a lot of money to me at that time, and I already knew at this point what was to come next. What I thought my sense of manhood was, was, was then taken, and just being in a very, very hard position. So at the age of 17, they had um, surrounded my, my neighborhood with barricades in front of my house with a loudspeaker, and I turned myself in. Now, when I was in that facility, when I was in that facility, I began finding who I really was. That seven and a half years turned into seven and, a half, seven and a half years of education, personal and spiritual development. I tapped in with who I was. And you say, I say prison is like a fucked up monastery sometimes because you have that time, you have your thoughts and they can do two things for you. They can drive you crazy or you can analyze them and you can become refined. And I've seen that in the practices of the other people around me. And I took that path, I took that path towards education and really deciding who am I gonna be when I come home. If one thing I took away from that sentence was that I'm a healer. And you see, our adversity and our struggles in life and the things that may have kicked us down and brought us to the lowest points, our adversity is really assets. 
And they have strategically positioned us to be healers in the areas that need the most love, that lack the most understanding, to bring tolerance, to bring, to bring that love, really. So, I mean, I've been out since 2016. I now travel and work on a national level, changing the youth prison model, um, taking it away from these close custody facilities. There's a lot of people making a lot of money on these facilities being in place, exposing these people, and, you know, really trying to make this into a place of rehabilitation. So, the next poem I'm going to perform for y'all, what's the time check? Okay, so the next poem I'm going to perform for y'all is called... It's called Speak Life. <clears throat> As I got ready one morning looking for my car keys, my headphones inhabited the songs of Damian Marley. He spoke to me clearer than if he had personally called me. He said, speak life. And my mind froze as if it had paused in time. Like the purpose of my work had been summarized in one line, speak life. And I thought about all the differences in political views and how we're subconsciously fed who should hate who. And the social constructs that influence mainstream views, making my writing write up a task list of other things that I should do. And at the end of that list, I was able to conclude that I'm not in control of what other people say or do, but yo, I can choose. I can choose to do things different. To lift labels with language that's targeted and specific, like, hey, you, yeah, there, you're really not a dumb kid. This isn't your subject. Your life isn't over. Your life is a project. Same day I listened to a podcast. Sound as touch was the topic on Radio Lab. You see, our words and our voice do more than make noise. They touch the recipient through vibration. So ask yourself, what kind of message are you relaying? Is it fear? Is it love? What are the words that you're saying because they matter? They can build a person up or shame them for their difference. Speaking is an act that must be disciplined. The words that we choose are the tools in which our children are conditioned with, so speak life in every circumstance. And if I could say one thing to y'all at the end of this, it is, you know, speak life, speak love. That is what God is. God is love. That's the frequency of love. You know what I mean? And only us, we have the ability to create that and bring that to a space. So with that, man, I fucking love y'all for real. Like, thank you. Yeah.